Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore and welcome to the Music Masterclass. This is my uh, series I do every week on Thursdays where we take a look at the process of making music, uh, composing, arranging, improvising, playing by ear, all the sort of creative acts that go along with music. And as has been the case the last couple of months and the next month or so, we will be focusing on harmony, the subject of the course that we are running in the community here, the Harmony and Chord Progressions course. And today, the main focus is going to be on, well, mainly on the augmented sixth chord. The augmented sixth chord is a very kind of special, unique chord. And when it's when it fits the music, it just fits it perfectly. And it's one of these things where it's uh, it, it, it gets used where it gets used. And it's not like a commonly used chord. But when it is, it's so perfect. And it's really the last specific type of chord that we're looking at in this course. I've made this point before. What we're going to do from here on out is more tying things together. Um, and let's, let me just uh, do something here. Okay. Um, less about uh, specific chords, but more about like stepping back and looking at the bigger picture. So we've been building vocabulary so far. And what we're going to be doing now is combining things more after this week. So this is the last kind of main bit of vocabulary. So I want to jump into because several people have submitted projects involving this uh, chord here. And so we've got quite a few. We've got Brian, we've got uh, Kevin Johnson, we've got Lonnie, we've got Jimmy, and we got Rod. So um, I'm going to kind of skip around a little through these because everyone has done a good job of finding some opportunities. And I would say some people have maybe pushed things a little further than others. And I'm going to start with Rod's White Christmas here because he has found like just uh, lots and lots of places uh, to use an augmented sixth chord. And this is going to be kind of my model for like when I look at the other project and say, yeah, you found some good ones here, but let's see if we can push it further. This is going to be my model for what I mean by pushing it further. So I'm just going to go ahead and play Rod's arrangement here. And uh, so we're in the key of C. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not sharing my screen. I'm not sharing my screen. Silly me. Give me a moment. Give me a moment. Um, oh, yes. And we have Jimmy's, which is a video. I, I, I think I mentioned that also. Um, uh, so get, uh, give me give me uh, two seconds or uh, a few more seconds than that to do my screen share so you can see what I'm doing here. Uh, da -da. Um, what else was I going to say? I'm going to post another video later today um, that's going to push things even further for people who are looking for even more as far as vocabulary goes. Um, but it's definitely the sort of thing where it's um, uh, less, how would, I, how would I put it, it's more advanced technique, more advanced application of the, of the idea. And in the course, I combine my discussion of augmented sixth chords with the discussion of Neapolitans and also the discussion of tritone substitutions, which is a jazz term that kind of encompasses both augmented sixth chord and Neapolitans, but puts it in a totally different uh, light. And so we're going to be, I'll, I'll be sharing a video about that for people who are interested in um, <clears throat> going that much deeper. All right. So we have White Christmas up. Excellent. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do here is um, bring up my chat over here. Cool. So this is Rod's uh, White Christmas arrangement. We're in the key of C. So the augmented sixth chord is going to be this sound here. What basically sounds like an A flat seven chord resolving to G. That's the basis of an augmented sixth chord. It's called that because the interval from A flat to F sharp is an augmented sixth. And then it resolves traditionally outward like that. But in chord simple terms, we would just call this an A flat seven chord and call that note G flat on top. <clears throat> and so this kind of gets into the jazz versus classical derivation of it. But this is the sound to be paying attention to. Every time you see the A flat seven chord, 
that's one of those things. And Rod has done uh, done us all a favor here and even put a box around his A-flat-7 chords where they show up. So you'll get to hear all the places where it works. And I would say it works marvelously almost every time. There's like one place where I'm like, yeah, I miss the original chord. And I'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, this is, this is really good. He did a thorough job here. So let's listen. No? All right. So, Rod, fantastic. You, I mean, you, you kind of nailed all these places where there were these great opportunities to use that augmented sixth chord. And, you know, in the demonstration video I did, I kind of uh, separated it out by talking about which scale degrees might be in the melody, because the augmented sixth chord is at its heart this set of notes, right? It's scale degree flat six, scale degree one, and scale degree sharp four. Anytime you have those notes in the melody, uh, it's a good opportunity. Well, anytime you have those notes in the melody and you're approaching a five chord. Um, the French augmented sixth has this D in it, scale degree two. And so that's another possibility when you encounter that one. Depending on your tolerance for such things, you might find scale degree three or scale degree four also works. Uh, you know, it, it just puts additional color on it. Not a color that you found much in the 19th century, but um, in the 20th century, uh, in jazz in particular, you will find that as well. So yeah, just walking through this right at the beginning. I'm not going to play the exact arrangement. We have a two chord and then this is one of those tailor-made situations. You've got the sharp four right there in the melody, just like in my demonstration of, um, right, that melody in my demonstration, sharp four to five. When you have that sharp four to five, it's, it's gonna work. Now, normally it might be a secondary dominant, going doing that and this is where the jazz concept of tritone substitution comes from in jazz we say hey this chord here is really substituting for this chord right so if you watch the video on tritone substitutions or any other video on tritone substitution you might be familiar with the sound of that a flat seven as being tritone substitution for d7 anyhow when you have that f sharp in the melody that scale degree sharp four great opportunity going on So there he has that same, and it was only one beat, but one beat was all he needed. Scale degree one, one of the tones of that chord going to five. Now, he could have put it at the beginning of the bar, right? Because that's scale degree two and would totally fit it. Had he wanted to, that would have been fine too. That would have been the French augmented sixth with that scale degree two in there. That would be absolutely fine, right? Um, and then he's got another nice version here, another real quick one. Um, um, in here, it's scale degree one, right? So he's got that. Um, the only place where he does it where I'm like, okay, I appreciate that you can do it, but you know, uh, here I probably wouldn't do it for real is this measure here. You know, that's um, 
sorry. That absolutely works, right? That's absolutely an approach to a dominant. Scale degree one in the melody fits the chord. The only reason I say, oh, I'd rather not do it there because I miss the minor four chord that was originally there. Um, right, the original minor four chord is so beautiful that in this case, I don't know that it actually improves the harmony in any way, but excellent, excellent, excellent job finding that opportunity. And then going on, he's got another one. Another quick, quick one there that again could have gone for two beats. It could have gone, right? It could have had the A flat seven or that, that augmented sixth happen right on beat three and be a French augmented sixth. Totally could have done that, right? So, uh, and then the second half of the tune is more or less the, the same stuff again. So great job finding all those opportunities. I am going to point out one other thing um, that is worth knowing about because I didn't really stress this in the demonstration. I didn't stress it at all in the demonstration, but in the video I, talk, I post later, I will talk about it more. And that is that you can also use this sound not just for the actual five, but for secondary dominance too. In other words, when you have secondary dominance in your piece, you can think about your approach to that secondary dominant. And so there's not really a lot of secondary dominance in this piece, but the main one we have is the C7 here going to F. So I could think about me being in the key of F. For these couple of bars here, I'm in the key of F. And it would be that sound, flat six to five. And so I would be looking to see if I could squeeze that in anywhere here. And the answer is I can, but I don't think you're going to like it. The jazz people in you might like that, but probably most people will see that as a little too, uh, a little too dissonant. This note here, it's a whole step above that French augmented sixth note. Um, so it doesn't totally not work, but it definitely pushes the sound a little further. I think in some other pieces we look at, we might find an opportunity to do that. So anyhow, great job there. All right, so I'm gonna now flip over to a couple others where people said, oh yeah, I only found one opportunity and you found great opportunities and then I'm going to see if we can find some more. So here's Brian uh, Brian Collins's version of Morning Has Broken, where he took his original uh, harmonization that he did for an earlier project, and right off the bat finds an opportunity, and then uh, said he struggled to find more. And I'm gonna try to see if we can help out here. So this is Brian's version of uh, Morning Has Broken. All right, so this is a really cool arrangement, and I'm guessing, I mean, I can't remember. I mean, I remember, Brian, that you did this piece earlier. I didn't look up the original uh, harmonization to see how much you might have changed since the original version, because I feel like that was before we were doing borrowed chords, so you might have added some more borrowed chords here. So um, before I talk about where, the, uh, where you actually did use the augmented sixth chord, I'm going to address why you didn't find other opportunities. Well, it's because you don't have any other five chords, right? I mean, the A chord, every place you could have had a five chord, you've you've basically replaced, right? You, you replace this five chord with a minor four chord, which is a great thing to do if you're trying to practice minor four chords. But had you made this back to a five chord, we could have found you an opportunity. So we're going to do that. Same in this measure here. You got a minor four chord here that originally could have been a five chord. And if you make it one, uh, you will be able to uh, get work another augmented six chord in there. I also want to mention that at the end, 
you have this sound here, a C chord, the flat seven chord, and that is fine as a borrowed chord to use as a triad, but more typically we would want that to be a seventh chord. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the triad sound, but this is a chord that is almost always played as a seventh chord. So if I play this arrangement and just add a B flat to it, I'm gonna play exactly what you have, but add a B flat. I did was add a B flat. We could even, if you wanted to keep the two voice texture, play it instead of the G. Or you could play the C on beat one and then a G and B flat on beat two so you keep that same rhythmic texture. All right, so there, that's more how that flat seven chord would normally work there. Also, uh, one other little detail, this measure here, notice there's no third here. If we let MuseScore play it, well, you've turned off chord symbols, which is great, but I'm, yeah, I'm aware that there's not a third in this chord, and I, I would definitely, um, uh, you know, be going out of my way. I would recommend going out of your way to work in, um, Oh yeah, I do need that, sorry. Um, uh, to work in thirds on those chords. All right, so let's talk about then the actual augmented sixth chord. Right, that works beautifully. And I like that you actually gave us the four chord first and didn't just hit us right over the head with an augmented sixth chord so quickly. It, it, it could have worked. Right? That totally could have worked. But I, I, I agree with, I think, your, um, your statement here. Annoyingly, it happens very near the start before you've established anything. And yeah, I, I, um, I agree that you don't want to put your coolest harmonic thing at the very beginning. It feels out of kilter. So, you know, you might want to do that only in, say, a second verse of the arrangement or something. That would be a thought. All right, so let's take a look at where some other opportunities would have been. So if I play this line here, right, if I played an A7 there in this measure, and then, and then gone on, I could then play and have my augmented sixth chord there. This is in the key of D. So if you haven't been doing the math on it, our augmented sixth chord is gonna be a chord built on steel degree flat six, which is B flat. It's gonna have a B flat and then G sharp, possibly spelt A flat. And this would make it an augmented, a, a French augmented sixth chord. Right, so that would have been an opportunity had you had a five chord. You also could have it both ways, because I really like the E7. Right? Or right, you could either steal time from the E7 to put in that augmented sixth chord or steal time from the A7 to throw in that augmented sixth chord. Same thing is going to happen on the next line. Had this been an A7? chord here instead of the G minor, you could have gone like that, or, or, right, again, steal time from the G or steal time from the A. It doesn't really matter who you steal that time for, uh, from. So that totally could have worked. The other thing that could work here is we do have this one secondary dominant here. Well, we have a couple secondary dominants. So um, we have this E7 here, which was a secondary dominant tonicizing a chord that you then replaced, right? This E7 was tonicizing an A chord and you've now replaced the A chord. 
but and that's legitimate. You can do that. That's sort of a deceptive resolution. It's a you know complicated advanced technique. It works when it works. Sometimes sounds weird. I think it works fine here. Um, so you have an E7 that is meant to go to A, but then you replace the A. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but because we're basically in the key of A here, this E7 is a secondary dominant. It makes me want to try scale degree flat six right before that. Um, in other words, a augmented sixth chord in the key of A right before that E7. Yeah, F sharp minor, and then, did I put that right? F sharp minor, and then instead of B minor, I'm playing an augmented sixth chord. And the melody note here is not one of our official melody notes, but it's got a jazz feel to it here, and it totally would work in a jazz setting works in a jazz setting. So that would be a possibility for you there if you wanted to do that. We have a similar situation, uh, but maybe not quite as effective uh, that would come up here if I decided to say, hey, this D7 is a secondary dominant in the key of G. So I want now to put a uh, augmented sixth chord in front of that. So hey, I'm, I'm going to make you guys think about this. If we're in the key of G, which we are for these couple of measures here. We've got our five to one in the key of G. What would an augmented sixth chord look like in the key of G? Anyone who's there by a keyboard able to type into the chat, give me your answer. What would the root, what would that base note of an augmented sixth chord be in the key of G? What what is the what is the basic chord that I'm trying to squeeze in here? So Brian is absolutely right. E flat. This B in the melody, mm, it's gonna be. It's going to be kind of uh, iffy, but if I voice it appropriately, I might get lucky. So I'm going to try. No, I did not like that at all. I did not like it at all. Okay, part of the problem was... I don't want to voice it with a B flat. So I definitely don't want the aug the German augmented sixth chord that would have the B flat. The B flat would totally clash with that B. But if I play more of an Italian version or a French version here, either of those could support this note. And I want to make an observation about this note. Um, this note here, I would call a Debussy note. This scale here, I mean, this chord here, the French augmented sixth, and I think the reason it's called that is because it reminds people of Debussy and Ravel. Um, it's part of the reason it reminds people of, of some French Impressionist composers is it kind of implies a whole tone scale, right? A whole tone scale, a scale made of nothing but whole steps. That's a scale that you see the French Impressionist composers using. At least that's the cliche. I don't know that they really used it that much more than anyone else, but they used it enough to get a reputation for using whole tone scales. And so that French augmented sixth chord with a B in the melody does have a French Impressionistic sound. And in a jazz setting, we might get away with that also. So that would have been another opportunity if you wanted to live with it and you said you tried it and rejected it. And I don't blame you for that. Dave, uh, maybe you might be right. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think so, though. So D Dave, if you're not seeing the chat, is asking, wasn't it called a French sixth way before the Impressionist? I actually don't think that's true, but you might be right about that. I don't know the total history of the terminology. I've just heard that that's not th that that that's why it's called that I, what i've always heard is that the term the, the countries the german french italian sometimes you'll hear about a swiss one also don't really mean anything but the only one that anyone really is able to give you any uh um 
explanation about is everyone will tell you, oh, the French one is called that because of Impressionists. And so maybe maybe just the conventional wisdom is just wrong. But yes, yeah, certainly the chord was used before the French Impressionists because my, my example, the very first example I give in the course of this is from Beethoven. And it's uh, it goes like this in the key of E flat. Whoops. Um, it goes boom. French augmented sixth chord in the key of E flat. It's C flat, E flat, F, and A. So that's a French augmented sixth chord being used by the very non-French Beethoven well before, uh, that's from Sonata Pathétique, so that's like from 1800, 1799, 1801, I forget the exact year. But um, French augmented sixth and Scarlatti, that could be interesting. I don't know. Um, but definitely the um, the other forms, the Italian and the German forms, you can find examples going back earlier. They're, they're few and far between, I will say that. They are few and far between pre- Pre class, pre late classical, you know, Beethoven, that 1800 kind of line is where they start becoming more common. But I found one in a Bach lute piece once, but then other people's uh, editions of that same Bach lute piece, they transcribed the piano, didn't have it. So I'm not positive. And yeah, the Mozart one, Mo, Mo, definitely Mozart used the German form you know, on, on a regular enough basis to, to that be a known quantity. So in any case, uh, that that is my uh, my feedback there on Brian's. You found the one opportunity that you gave yourself based on your initial harmonization. If you wanted to push it further, what you would have needed was to give you, give yourself more five chords, give yourself more five chords, and then you would have been able to pull it. Now you do make a comment here that I will um, um, uh, address a little bit. The augmented sixth chord needs to lead to a five. Yes. Does it need to come from a four or some sort of six? There's what it normally does, what produces the best voice leading, and does it really have to? I would say no, it doesn't have to. And you will find in the classical literature pre-1800, almost always it will come from uh, something in which that bass line is just like that Beethoven version. I'm kind of plunking out that right? Um, an 1897 harmony book that mentions uh, French six. Well, that's great, but 1897 would be after, you know, those people started writing, so it could be that that's the start of that term. So I don't know. Um, so the French Impressionists were definitely doing their thing then. Um, so that line, boom, 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 scale degree six to flat six to five, that is the characteristic bass line. So yes, the approach to the augmented sixth chord is stereotypically that, but don't rule it out. It's as that sound becomes more and more accepted into the mid 19th century, you know, the late, you know, as you get into the Romantic era and Impressionistic and then 20th century music and then jazz, we stop caring so much about where, where how you got there. And I would also say that about, Dave, I, you posted this nice video from Gareth Green about uh, approaches to the diminished chords. And it gives me an opportunity to repeat one of my favorite sayings. And I love it because uh, it wasn't supposed to be about music, but it is. And it's from Ella Fitzgerald. She was talking about life. And she said something like, um, it's not about it's not about where you came from. It's about where you're going or, you know, it's about where you're going, not where you came from, something like that. And the thing is, I first thought of that statement and and and, and said something like that out loud in one of my classes um, talking about diminished chords specifically. I was talking about diminished chords. I said, really, the approach to the diminished chord isn't as important as the resolution. The resolution of it is what makes or break that diminished chord because almost any chord before it, you can make it work. And uh, and the same is kind of true about the augmented sixth chord. And so I, I said something like that, you know, it's not really about where it came from, it's about where you're going. And that could probably apply to life also. And then one of my students Googled it and it turned out that 
the if you look if you Google some variation on that expression, Ella Fitzgerald is what comes up. So it's a a singer, a, a jazz singer for people who don't know, a musician who said that about life and uh, and but it applies to augmented chords, augmented sixth chords, and diminished chords as well. All right, so I'm now going to flip over um, to Kevin Johnson's version because you also did a really good job of finding opportunities. And there's going to be one place where I'll be able to make that same observation about this sort of augmented, uh, this mm -hmm. whole tone scale and see if we can come to peace <laughs> with uh, another opportunity in here. So this piece, uh, Dona Nobis Pachem, uh, I can't even remember why it was that this piece was on my mind recently. It came up in some other context a few months ago. Um, and I can't remember why. Um, but in any case, we're going to hear uh, Kevin Johnson's uh, arrangement of uh, Dona, um, Dona Nobis Pachem. Here we go. <laughs> All right, lovely, beautiful. It's a wonderful song, great sentiment for, for, the, for these days. that has been on a lot of people's minds, I know. Um, and you're absolutely right, Kevin. Yes, you. there was a total opportunity right here in bar seven because it's the exact same situation. It's scale degree one going to the leading tone and it's uh, an approach to the five chord. So would have totally worked. We're in the key of F and so our augmented sixth chord is this. It's basically a D flat seven chord. Right? Totally could have worked there. Could you have also squeezed it into bar five? Well, yes, depending on how hard, how hard you really want to push this idea. I'm not going to claim this is going to be a good idea. Right? For just that half a beat. Could have done that. Or could have stolen time from the C7. Right? Yeah, you could. And that would give us that exact same sound I was talking about. This is that French sound, because a French augmented sixth chord would be this, and this would be the other note to kind of help complete that uh, whole tone scale. If you voice things exactly just so, you might be able to make it sound good to your ears. But I would say, given the context of the arrangement, which doesn't have those kinds of sounds elsewhere, it's going to sound out of place. But I would say if you had voiced all your like one chords as major seventh chords and stuck ninths and things on your on your dominant chords more, you know, if you had done more jazz voicings or just color full voicings in general, you might have been more okay with that or, or either of those. So um, by the way, this E flat chord, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I mean, it's a, a nice sounding chord and this chord, um, I can, uh, well, I'm curious what you're, I'm going to play it again and pay attention to this E flat chord, everyone. And then Kevin, feel free to tell us, you know, where it's coming from in your mind. And then I'll tell you a little bit what I'm thinking about. So the question is, what are you thinking there about that E flat chord, where it's coming from? Give you a moment or two to catch up because uh, I know the chat runs behind, but I want to try a couple things.
So I'm trying a couple things and they may or may not um, influence your answer. But here, here's what I'm thinking about this E flat chord. So first of all, it is a flat seven chord, but because you're voicing it as a uh, sixth chord without a seventh, it's not behaving as a borrowed chord in the usual sense. The same comment that I had made to Brian earlier, that that flat seven chord normally is a dominant. But if I play it as one, I, I still like it. There's the dominant, right? Because it's jazz, right? I mean, that's a jazz sound. Um, and then it would be functioning as that borrowed chord flat seven as a dominant, and then just resolving deceptively to six. So that would be fine. But the other thing that I'm hearing based on your actual voicing here, your voicing has that F in it, and it has this, um, which really kind of, cements it in my mind as being, you know, it's an added ninth on that chord and really makes me want to hear the seventh also. But um, if instead I play this, I hear this as a minor four chord basically um, with uh, the third in the bass. That's really what I hear, minor four. So I, this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing really a minor four chord in which there happens to be some additional color of a B flat and, a, and an F thrown in there. But harmonically speaking, I'm hearing it as minor four more than I'm hearing. So I'm hearing it as C minor um, without that seventh. If that seventh D flat were in there, I would absolutely be saying, oh yeah, now I hear it as an E flat chord. But either way, I would say, yeah, it's borrowed, borrowed from F minor and, and that's where it's coming from. But here's the other thing. If it was this, if it was the D flat somewhere in that voicing, then we could also say, hey, this is a tritone substitution for A7. Right? Tritone substitution for A7. A7 with a sharp nine in the melody, E flat seven would be the tritone substitution for it. So that would be another place that this could have come from. So the other things that I'd still want to try to do here is see if these uh if this secondary dominant could possibly um support uh the uh the augmented sixth chord sixth chord so this g7 is a secondary dominant tonicizing c so if we think of ourselves as in the key of c the augmented sixth chord in the key of c would have a flat as its root and so i would want to try to put an a flat here an A flat seven chord here. And I look at that melody of C and say, hey, that works beautifully. This B flat is fine. It's a whole step above that A flat and it's just a passing tone. So I kind of feel like an A flat is going to work well here. So I want to try that. <laughs> then we're going to talk about that approach. So it's colorful in part because you also have a ninth in the melody on the G7 and maybe, and then a 13th in the melody on the C7, and maybe we've wandered too far into jazz land. Um, I don't know, but you know, that would be a totally legit jazz thing. So augmented sixth chord, but it is, a little out of character for the piece given what you've done but here's the cool thing that a flat suddenly this e flat feels like it's tonicizing an a flat and it really makes me want to hear it in that context and play this e flat as an actual dominant seventh and then hear the a flat seven it's going to be like a chain of dominance here e flat seven to a flat seven and then the A flat seven coming down to G, and then the G seven going to C seven. It's, it's going to be very dominant seventy, but yeah, it's worth a shot. Okay, so I don't like it, but I like the idea of it. I mean, it was like a really cool thing to try, but I don't like how it sounded. I would still. I might play around with voicings a little bit more to see if there was a way to like it. Because on paper, I love that idea. I love the fact that that E flat seven works as a borrowed chord, but also works to tonicize that augmented sixth chord. 
I think the melody is just getting in my way of enjoyment of it. But I, I don't know. Anyhow, that's uh, that is my thought about that. It's um, it's not bad, not bad. But I just don't love it for this piece because this piece doesn't have those sounds in it. So in any case, that's um, that's a thought. It's a thought. But then also, you know, we can have similar things. That last line, we've got two different uh, secondary dominants. And yeah, you might be right, Joanne. It could be a different song or just a different arrangement of this one. I think if the rest of the song had set us up to have those level of richness in the voicings, having ninths and sixths and on all of these chords and uh, you know major sevenths on the one chord, if it had had that kind of jazz sound to the voicings, I think I would have been more okay with that um, because I do like the sound of it. It just felt out of place to me personally. Um, but yeah, borderline. All right. So here again, we have some secondary dominance and I think we can try the same thing here. This E7 is tonicizing A. There's scale degree flat six F. So I'm going to try an F7 on the beginning of that bar. Um, so instead of B flat, instead of that, I could go. And then the same story here for the A minor seven, or, you know, this D seven is a secondary, don secondary don dominant tonicizing the G. Scale degree six is E flat, an E flat seven in place of that A minor seven. So that would be an interesting little progression there. I took the liberty of changing that diminished chord into a C7, so I could use another uh, augmented sixth chord there. So if we wanted to push the idea of augmented sixth chords as far as humanly possible, that would be it. I would use one in A minor, and then one in G minor, and then one, one in F. In point of fact, I like the original thing you have here better than my F7, better than my second, better than my augmented sixth chord there, but I do very much like my E flat seven here. So I like that a lot. So I might keep your B flat and then put in an E flat. Again, if I'm trying to push these uh, augmented sixth chords as, as far as humanly possible, I'm not saying it's better. It's just you know, how to, how to squeeze a little more mileage out of it. So, um, yeah. Um, one thing to notice about this, by the way, um, if you do that, notice what happens in the, in the bass. We get this chromatic descending line. This is what happens when you use uh, augmented sixth chords in this way. We've got a circle of fifths progression here, basically, uh, that we are then using augmented sixth chords in. The same thing happens with tritone substitutions in jazz. You turn circle of fifths, boom, boom, you turn that into into half steps. That's what augmented sixth chords do, and it's what tritone substitutions do. They give you half step descending bass lines. So they're, they're kind of cool in that way. Okay, I'm going to now flip over. So yeah, th this you I think you made all the right calls as far as putting in uh, this basic one here and, uh, and then noticing that you found a, that there was one other basic place where you could have done it. Those are the ones you can do safely and not change the character of the piece. I think all of the things that I did in addition to push it are, you know, definitely pushing the piece in a different direction. And so they're not necessarily what you want, but for the purpose of a project, we do that. So with that in mind, I'm going to flip over to Lonnie's uh, piece here. Uh, where's Lonnie's here? Um, and so she has one exactly where I want it to be. And then we'll talk about a similar kind of thing here. So here's her version of Okay, so those of you in the United States know this piece on, well, most of us know it under the name My Country Tis of Thee. The official name of the piece is America. Um, but 
and everyone outside the United States knows this song as the uh, British national anthem, God Save the King or Queen, whoever happens to be alive at the time, right? So um, you'll everyone, so lots of you will recognize this piece. And yeah, I will talk about where she's got an augmented sixth chord and where there were possibly some other opportunities. <laughs> So you've done a lot of really cool things in this arrangement, right? A lot of just really cool, interesting harmonies. And but I'm going to cut to the chase and say, let's make sure that we've got our sec our um, our augmented six chords where we want them, and see if we can find some others. For this piece, I'm going to tell you right now. I kind of went through this piece, and because uh, I was in my mind thinking I might do a demonstration where I use multiple national anthems from my demonstration before realizing I could say everything I needed to with just the United States one and then leave the others for you. So that's why I didn't do this. But my basic, um, um, my basic uh, harmonization of this would have gone something like this. Right, just one and five. You know, you can get a little more fancy than that. And I would, I would suggest that every single one of those five chords I played could have been approached with an augmented sixth chord, or maybe not everyone, but right. If we have a five chord here at the beginning of the second bar, as Lonnie does, could have totally been there, right? So in the key of C, again, our augmented sixth chord is going to have A flat as our root. So, um, Be a French augmented sixth chord. Normally, that scale degree two would resolve by step um, or keep a common tone when using a French augmented sixth chord, but yeah, it works. So, if you wanted to push it as far as possible, you could have done that. Then, there she's got her um, uh, German augmented sixth chord in this case, going to five. And that is the other ready-made place for you when you got your scale degree one going to the leading tone. Absolutely the case there. Um, so uh, yeah, that absolutely works. Um, there's a couple things that I would talk about um, uh, uh, harmonically, uh, Lonnie, because I've, I've made this comment before and it just bears repeating. You have a whole lot of chords that aren't resolving the way they should if you want them to behave the way you've indicated them. So like this E7 chord, that would work beautifully if it was going to A minor, right? So then you would have a secondary dominant. As it is, what you've done is you've got a, a deceptive resolution going to four. which is fine, deceptive resolution. But then by also putting in its uh, actual secondary dominant, that's fine. These are all fine things to do, but I will say that's a lot of effort being spent not thinking about the thing I want us thinking about for this, which is augmented six chords. So I'm going to re-look at this now, thinking about how there could have been an augmented sixth chord in here. And I think you're gonna see there's a couple other opportunities. So for instance, um, Um, uh, um, got to think here. I got to think. Um, this E7 here is the five chord in the key of A minor, right? So the augmented sixth chord in the key of A minor would have had F as a root. Well, you do have an F chord here, but it's a plain diatonic triad. If you actually had 
the D sharp in it, then you could have had an augmented sixth chord right here also. Is what I would have done. I probably wouldn't have done that deceptive resolution, the F here, simply because you already gave us an F chord there and it sort of spoils the surprise a little bit. I would either lose this F7 if you wanted this one, or I, I would rather just have the A minor here because I, I, I rather like the A minor that was being set up. But in any case, there was another opportunity where if you recognize the uh, secondary dominant there as another opportunity to use this concept, you could have used it there. All right, now you've gone to D minor. Um, for a couple of measures, which you don't really have to notate that as a change. You could just say that this is all basically five of two going to two. Totally could have just done that um, rather than notate the key change. Next week, we'll start talking more about modulations. So given that this is five in the key of D minor, the question is, could we have used a uh, um, augmented sixth chord there? Well, in the key of D minor, I'm always playing a major scale, by the way, to talk about scale degrees, because then I don't have to, then, then I can just say scale degree flat six and not have to worry about, well, do we mean melodic minor or harmonic minor or natural minor, right? So I always play major scales when I talk about scale degrees. So in the key of D, scale degree flat six is B flat. That's vibrato, by the way. Um, so um, could we have gone something like instead of, Set of that, which is lovely. But if the goal is to push our understanding of augmented sixth chords, here's what I might have tried there. Uh, a two chord in the key of, um, a, of, D, of D minor, then our augmented sixth chord, then our five chord. So that's what you could have done, again, if the goal is just to find every opportunity to uh, use augmented sixth chords. Do I like it better? Eh, not necessarily. Um, but it's there for you, right? And then, um, uh, so yeah, there's probably a couple other places where that could have happened. I'm not really sure what this chord is here, flat six, sharp five. So we would have to unpack this chord a little bit more to understand what you really mean by this. I think this is something different than what you're calling it. Um, and uh, uh, again, I would just advise you to stick to simple harmonizations where the only variable is the augmented sixth chord or whatever the project is about. So this goes for kind of all the projects up through now. I I think of these as like controlled experiments where I want there to be just one variable. I want there to be a nice simple harmonization and then another harmonization in which the only difference, literally the only difference is the new chord that we're trying out. So you can hear the effect of that chord. Because as soon as we put all these other chords in here, now we're not focused on the augmented sixth chord that we're trying to focus on. So I really, really want to stress for people to start with a relatively simple harmonization, doesn't have to be just one, four, and five, but something relatively simple, and then make one and only one change. And that is the change that the project is about, whether it's inserting diminished chords or uh, augmented sixth chords. So um, that'll be a suggestion there. Um, there's a chord here that you're calling a French augmented sixth. And this sound is the sound of a French augmented sixth. But what key is that the French augmented sixth chord in? That's the French augmented sixth chord in D or D minor, not in, not in C. So this would have to go to A to actually be a French augmented sixth. As it is, it is a B flat seven kind of sound, but it's not functioning as an augmented sixth chord. It's actually functioning probably as a borrowed chord. Um, flat seven, and then instead of going directly to one, it goes to five and then goes to one or three as the case may be. So um, so yeah, be careful about that. that. That chord labeled French augmented sixth isn't really working that way, but it could have if we accept those sort of jazzy sounds, right? French augmented sixth, the 
real French augmented sixth in C, which has A flat in the root, going to five. That totally could have happened there also. Um, so anyhow, that's, um, those are some places there. So finally, I want to come to Jimmy's version here, which is a video. Uh, and it's really, really cool uh, because, yeah, we get to listen to it, watch his hands, and then talk through it. So I'm going to play the version here. This is the Ash Grove. And, yeah, he's found two marvelous places to use uh, um, uh, augmented sixth chords here. And then I'll talk about one other, a couple others that would be possible. Because I actually thought about using the Ash Grove for my demonstration. Oops, let's go back to the beginning of it. Here we go. Here's Jimmy. So Jimmy, great job on that, and I, I have to say that 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 one at the end, that the oh, not the end, of, at the end of the bridge, the where you did it in that spot there, um, that I actually laughed out loud with joy when I heard that um, in your video, like when you first when I first listened to it. Yeah, because everything about I think you're 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 probably slowing down a little to make sure you find the notes, but it was very effective musically as well to have that little rallentando in there. So anyhow, great job. So he has right. So going into going into the five chord there, he does that there. And there's a lot of different ways that could have worked because I think that's how you did it. I actually should listen again, um, but you can play with that. Yeah, so that also could have gone, so that totally works, absolutely totally works. Going into five here, but if we thought about this as being a two chord here, we could have done it like that also, right? It could have gone, if the original harmonization had been six, two, five, then it could have gone six, two, flat six, five, flat six being our augmented sixth chord. And then also, could have done it there also, right? In that final case, instead of one, six, four to five, could have been flat six to five. Um, this actually is part of why the video that I put, put in my uh, newsletter there, the uh, What Comes Before Five video, it was this very, it, I don't know if it was just this piece, but it was that type of thinking, that that situation where you have something that you kind of want to be a five chord, but you're kind of stuck with the tonic and the melody for a little while, and how are you gonna deal with that situation? And we usually think of one, six, four to five as our answer, but we also normally know that a suspension resolving is a possibility. But the augmented, augmented sixth chord is another lovely solution to that. When you get to the bridge, uh, let's go to the bridge. So you have an uh, basically an E7 here, tonicizing A minor, right? So you, you're tonicizing the two chord. We could put a secondary, I mean, I keep saying a secondary dominant. We could put a augmented sixth chord there also if we're, you know, okay with the sound. Right? 
that sound there, this, okay, so here's the problem. It's not a big problem. This is in the key of A minor, that scale degree flat three, right? In minor keys, that's always going to be a really good choice. It lets you have, um, it lets you have uh, in the key of A minor, this is a German augmented sixth chord, and then it resolves nicely to five. The only thing is we get these parallel fifths. And so this is why in German augmented sixth chords, we typically don't resolve straight to five. We try to hide it by going, by putting in a one, six, four also. Our augmented sixth chord, and then one, six, four to five. But uh, we don't have time to do that here. Uh, in the melody, it just doesn't, the melody doesn't support that. So you have to decide, could I get away with those parallel fifths? Check the literature. Lots of composers said, yeah, I can do that. I, I, I can be okay with it. So in any case, in the key of A minor, instead of going straight to five, we could have our augmented sixth. Then you have five, and then you very nicely found that sound. That's the one that made me really happy because it's kind of unexpected and cool and fun. So that's that's uh, that's great because there was the augmented sixth chord going into the five at the end of the bridge. And it sounds great there because the way it worked with the melody and the way the key was changing there really caught me by surprise and I loved it. It was awesome. So Thanks, everyone. That was a whole lot on augmented sixth chords, and um, they're cool chords. I mean, yeah, you don't use them that much, and I was pushing to see how how hard can we push to use them a lot, and then you pick your favorites and use them. That's that's always how it goes with this. So anyhow, thanks for all the music. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the questions and the feedback. And uh, yeah, next week we'll be back with more of uh, this and hope, you know, we'll, we'll still be looking at people's earlier projects because I want to make sure we're good on the vocabulary before we worry too much about other stuff, but we've got the vocabulary now. So everything we do is going to be an opportunity to also talk about the vocabulary and make sure that we're solid on it while we continue to move forward. We're into the home stretch now and uh, yeah, things are coming together beautifully and I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. So see you next time for more music.